Good afternoon, my name is Sean Olive, and the title of my talk today is Modeling and Predicting Listener Headphone Preference Ratings. A bit about me, uh, I'm a senior fellow in acoustic research at Harman International, where I've worked since 1993. Prior to that, I was a research scientist uh, in acoustics at the National Research Council of Canada, uh, where I started my career with uh, Dr. Floyd Toole. Uh, in 2013, I became president of the Audio Engineering Society, did that for a few years. And uh, over the course of the last 30 years, we've published papers on perception and measurement of sound quality uh, for loudspeakers, headphones, listening rooms, microphones, car audio, anything related to audio that affects sound quality. So today the talk will focus on <clears throat> basically two topics. The first topic will give a, uh, a brief synopsis of all this research we've done, why we did it, uh, what did we learn, uh, from it, uh, we'll talk about the development of two new target curves, one for around ear, on ear headphones, and the other for in ear headphones. I'll discuss two models that predict sound quality of headphones based on these uh, Harman target curves that we've developed. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some more recent research where we've been looking into how headphone measurements vary across different test fixtures. And I'll focus uh, specifically on the BK Hats Type 5122 since. I think that would be of most interest to this audience. So in 2012, we started uh, this journey into researching headphones. And uh, in total, we've published uh, 19 papers related to headphones over the past seven years, two book chapters, some patents. And uh, all this research, uh, because it's published, you can dive into it and read all, uh, all the details that I'm leaving out today uh, because I can't possibly discuss it thoroughly in, in just 45 minutes. But our research motivation began in 2012 because uh, uh, the iPhone uh, had come out, uh, there were streaming services, suddenly audio became a very mobile experience. You took music with you wherever you were and uh, the need for headphones suddenly uh, exploded. And we started measuring and testing and, and at that point Harman had, you know, we had a small uh, <clears throat> headphone business, AKG, mostly focused on studio headphones, but we really had no headphones for the consumer market, so uh, we were kind of caught by surprise, and uh, so I started measuring headphones, uh, for different models, different brands, and we found they were all over the map, and it was very clear that people, there was no consensus on, on what the target curve should be, uh, very little consensus on how to measure it, and uh, as a result, the, the, the headphone industry was, was in chaos. And uh, there were opportunities for people to just go to China, manufacture a headphone, slap a brand on it, and charge a lot of money and market the crap out of it. So that's, that, that was the state of the industry in 2012. And uh, <clears throat> we could see that there was clear, clearly a need for some science to make sense of it. Luckily, uh, in 2017, a researcher named Bree Bart uh, published a paper in JASA, which basically quantified what we were finding, that there was absolutely no correlation between frequency response and price. And he very nicely captured it in this graph uh, that you see in the top right. Uh, the solid curve is this target curve that uh, we came up with in, in 2015. It's changed slightly, but this is what's generally considered to be a good sounding headphone if it measures, if it meets this curve. And the dotted curve is the mean response of these 283 headphones that Brebart had, had uh, measured. And you can see that the error between the solid curve and the dotted curve uh, varies from 2.5 to 13 dB, so, so quite a large error. And uh, down on the bottom, you can see uh, Brebart has plotted this error <clears throat> in the headphone uh, from this target and the retail price. So you would hope that as you pay more money, uh, the error goes down, but in fact, you can see it's it's really uh, quite random, and uh, uh, he's calculated the correlation coefficient for circumoral, uh, in-ear, and super-oral headphones, and it's all it's very low uh, with price. It ranges from 0 0.02 for super-oral headphones to a high of 0 0.12. So uh, this confirms what we believed at the time, that uh, there's no uh, <clears throat> guarantee to get good sound at any price, and certainly paying more money doesn't guarantee better sound. So uh, this is all based on measurements. What about listening tests? So that's, that's where we came in. We uh, started to do lots of listening tests. 
And uh, I just want to point out this dotted curve is, uh, I, I've normalized their mean uh, average curve with this blue dotted curve to 500 hertz, uh, which is where we normally uh, uh, match the two curves together. And you can see that uh, on average, the average headphone is very, uh, a very dull sounding <clears throat> and uh, yeah, very dull sounding compared to the Harman target. Uh, not much energy between 1 and 10K. And uh, between 100 hertz and 500 hertz, there's actually too much energy, uh, making headphones sound very muffled and boomy. And then below 100 hertz, you can see that they're rolling off. So in 2012, we did our very first headphone listening experiment. And the basic question was, can, can we get consistent results? And do people who are trained basically agree on what sounds good and what doesn't sound good? So we took some headphones <clears throat> that we had in our lab. Uh, we included some competitors. Beats by Dre at the time was, was the number one selling headphone, uh, had 50% market share. So we had to include that. They also uh, had basically legitimized charging $300 for a headphone, which people would buy uh, like it was cocaine. They were uh, uh, they, they established this uh, this price point, but uh, previously was was there were very few people that would spend that much money. Uh, we also included a Bose headphone, which was very popular, a V Moto, which was popular amongst uh, young people and gamers, and we basically uh, did a test where. They would compare these different headphones four at a time. Uh, they were not aware of what they were, what the brands were, because they would come in and the test administrator would substitute these headphones on the listener uh, as they clicked between four different choices. Uh, they would, test administrator would take them off, put on another pair, uh, and uh, they would go through a set of trials and rate each of these headphones. Now, this was a very labor intensive, very tedious process. A lot of work for the test administrator, a lot of delays, but nonetheless, uh, we were able to come up with some results. But <clears throat> what we learned from this process is that even though the listener wasn't aware of the brand or the price or how it looked, after a while they became, they learned uh, the headphone by its feel, how much it weighed, what the what the uh, clamping force was on their head, and they could recognize, oh yeah, that's, that's headphone, uh, that's the heavy headphone that hurts my ears. Last time I gave it a three, I'm gonna give it a three this time. So uh, in this sense, it's no longer a blind test. It's, it's somewhat biased and uh, because they're identifying headphones based on factors other than sound quality. Now the next slide shows <clears throat> the mean preference ratings for each headphone indicated by the bars. And above that, we show the measurements uh, made on a grass ear simulator, uh, left and right channels. And the dotted green curve in each graph uh, below the frequency response measurements is the average listener's perceived spectral balance of that headphone. So a flat dotted curve means they, they, they believed it sounded very balanced. Uh, if it's rolling off in the bass, it, it, they're saying it sounds thin. If it has a, uh, a boosted uh, curve in the bass, then they're saying it has too much bass and so on. So you can see that the highest rated curve, HP1, uh, the highest rated headphone has relatively smooth frequency response. Uh, and as you go from left to right, the, the scores get lower and the, and the curves get much more erratic and less smooth and less flat. Uh, in the case of HP6, it's, uh, it's very irregular. It has some resonances, some dips, and people are indicating it sounds boomy in this case. Uh, now, an interesting example is HP4. Headphone 4, you can see it scored 4.9, and the average perceived spectral balance shows it's rolling off in the bass, even though the acoustic measurements show it's rising in the bass. So for us, that was a bit of a, a mystery and we went and surveyed the listeners after they did the test, and it turned out that half the listeners said that, oh yeah, this headphone has a lot of bass, and the other half said, no, it sounds very thin. And it turned out it was related to how the headphone uh, coupled to their heads, uh, how well it's sealed, and how much resulting bass leakage there was. So depending on whether it fit the listener, gave a, a good seal, this was happened to be a, a headphone with uh, that had large cups that didn't uh, fit on the head very uh, with a firm seal and uh, it turns out that the that the fit and the seal is a critical factor in how listeners will rate it and how it measures so early on we learned that uh, getting a good seal and controlling for that variable is critical if you want to be able to get consistent subjective measurements and be able to correlate them with acoustic measurements 
So in 2013, uh, we started to, instead of just measuring and listening to random headphones, we said, let's, let's do a test where we take headphones and equalize them to different targets. And this allowed us to directly compare what was the standard at that time, the diffuse, the diffuse field standard and the free field standard, which at that time, uh, people were supposed to be designing their headphones to these targets. Now, we thought uh, the, the diffuse field standard, in our thinking, didn't make sense because people uh, don't listen to music in diffuse rooms. In a typical listening room, you're listening to stereo music in a sound field that has a very strong direct component, uh, some strong early reflections, maybe from the, first, from the wall, the side reflection wall, maybe the ceiling, the floor. But after a short period of time, you're not getting a lot of late reflected sound because of uh, absorption, because of the directivity of the loudspeaker, and so on. So it didn't make sense that we design headphones for diffuse sound fields when we uh, typically listen in rooms that are, are quite uh, semi-reflective with a strong direct sound component. So our hi hypothesis was that headphones should ideally uh, be optimized so that they simulate a typical uh, listening setup in a room. So you take a well-designed flat uh, speaker and a coquely flat on axis with good off, good off axis sound. And if your headphone <clears throat> is uh, simulates that acoustic behavior, then we think stereo recordings should sound good over headphones since they're designed to sound good through loudspeakers, good loudspeakers in a room. Anyways, that, that was our hypothesis. So we went into this room and measured uh, with a stereo and a surround sound system uh, <clears throat> the transfer function at the eardrum reference point uh, with a mannequin. And uh, that became the basis of our, uh, the baseline for our Harman target curve. We did a spatial average of the mannequin, and of course we had calibrated the uh, system and the subwoofer so that it produced a smooth uh, in-room steady state response. So, with, these, uh, with this new Harman target curve, we designed an experiment where we equalize headphones to different targets. One of the choices was a headphone with no EQ, just the raw headphone. And then we had uh, two different diffuse field curves, one uh, based on the work of Hammershoy and Muller over in Denmark, another diffuse field variant based on Muller's work. And, uh, and then we added a third, uh, sort of a modified diffuse field calibration based on work done by Lorho where he took the standard diffuse field and adjusted this, this 3K uh, ear canal resonance uh, downwards. And he found that people on average, instead of preferring a gain of uh, 13 dB at three kilohertz, it was modified down to about three dB. So, uh, and then we included a free field and then two Harman target curves that, uh, that slightly uh, varied in terms of the bass and treble, but uh, otherwise very similar. Uh, we did the experiment where we applied these targets to two different headphones, a open back Sennheiser HD 518 and uh, a very well regarded at the time magnetic planar headphone, a DS LCD2. So each target curve was rated by trained listeners based on preference using three different music selections and we repeated that once and then we did the experiment uh, a second time with each headphone. And the results are as follows. Uh, in the first experiment using the Sennheiser headphone, uh, we found that the Harman target, the, the first target was preferred over all the other uh, target curves, uh, including the diffuse field targets, the modified diffuse by Lorho, uh, strongly preferred over the headphone without any equalization, and the least preferred was the free field calibrated headphone. In the second experiment <clears throat> with the ADS LCD2, our second Harman target was, was even more strongly preferred over the first target. Uh, both were strongly preferred over the diffuse field option, uh, as well as the ADS headphone with no EQ. And uh, consistent with the first experiment, the free field option was the least preferred. So we have <clears throat> consistency across two different headphones, two different experiments that this target curve that we developed is preferred over the current diffuse field standards as well as the free field, and uh, as well as two headphones uh, that have been designed to their own target curve. 
In 2014, <clears throat> in 2014 we did a, a large experiment where we, we took this, this new target curve and we traveled uh, across the world to see whether there was wide acceptance. Uh, now at the time, we, uh, our marketing department said that we should just uh, design our headphones to the Beats headphone because at that time it was the largest selling headphone uh, remarkable success and uh, my argument was well do we really want to emulate their uh, sound quality or do we uh, actually want to emulate their marketing because my uh, suspicion was it had nothing to do with sound and more to do with the marketing but to test that hypothesis I had to generate I had to create a um, we had to create a methodology where we can remove uh, the visuals and the marketing uh, f from the test so we developed this uh, method called headphone virtualization, where we take a target headphone, we measure its response at the drum reference point, we design a digital filter to uh, apply to our simulator or replicator headphone, uh, which we measure at the uh, drum reference point. And the idea is to basically acoustically simulate the target headphone through the simulator headphone. And in this way, you can basically uh, compare different headphones, virtual versions of them through the exact same headphone, and you're effectively removing any, any bias related to brand, uh, feel, and, and marketing. But first, we had to validate the methodology. So we did a study where we compared uh, the actual headphones with virtual versions of them, and we found the correlation was quite good, 0.86 using both spectral and preference ratings. However, uh, it wasn't a perfect. Some of the sources of error include differences between the methods in terms of leakage effects, tactile fit, weight, which were present in the uh, tests where they compared actual headphones, but these effects were controlled in the virtual tests. So I went on the road. This was clearly before the days of COVID to four different countries where we uh, tested a large number of listeners, both trained and untrained. And the headphones included this Harman Target and three headphones that we virtualized, including the Sennheiser HD800, the Odyssey, and the Beats, by Le the Beats Studio by, uh, by Dr. Dre. Uh, a total of 238 listeners participated, uh, uh, covering a wide range of ages, both male and female, and we had them uh, assess their listening experience in four categories. We developed an iPad app so that we could uh, administ administer the tests in a very efficient way, a very repeatable way, so they could <clears throat> switch between the virtual headphones, give a rating and a comment, and continue on to the next trial. So here are the results of listening experience on which headphones they preferred. You can see that there's really not much of an effect. Uh, all the listeners, regardless of experience, tended to rank these headphones in the same order. Uh, what you see is that the more experience they have, the more they're able to d discriminate between them and use the, the entire scale. Uh, and this is consistent with previous studies where we've compared trained and untrained listeners. So here are just the trained listeners <clears throat> from different Harman locations in uh, the US, Germany, and China very consistent. And if you look at the untrained listeners, you can see there's much more noise in the data. Uh, there's much more uh, variation, but the overall trends are very similar in terms of preference. Moving on to the effect of country, uh, we found no real uh, effect on headphone preference across these different countries. Uh, which headphones they preferred was pretty consistent across country, which is good to hear because uh, we don't want to design products specifically for different markets if we can avoid it. It seems that uh, sound quality is universal. Looking at age in the different age categories, again, not much of an effect here, except when we get to the age category of 55 and over, where there's a, a slight preference for headphone two, uh, which is a headphone that is flat in the base and has a bit uh, boosted high. So we think that this could be related to age and uh, presbycusis and a brighter headphone with less bass could certainly help in speech intelligibility. Uh, finally, we show you the, the uh, measurements of each headphone along with their preferences. And the solid curves are the measurements of the actual headphones and the dotted curves are measurements of the virtual headphones on the replicator headphones. So you can see there's very good agreement between the virtual equalized version and the actual headphone. And again, you see uh, the most preferred headphone follows the Harman target, and headphones that get lower ratings tend to deviate more from this. So our next uh, focus was to come up with a similar um, 
uh, Suna study on in-ear headphones, and we wanted to study whether there was a different preferred target curve for an IE headphone, what happens when you, you go from an over-ear, on-ear, to putting something inside your ear canal. Uh, is there a different uh, target curve? So uh, with that in mind, we developed a, a target curve uh, that we then went out and tested against 30 different models, varying in price from $26 to $1,000. And we included various uh, <clears throat> transducer types, dynamic, uh, uh, let's see, different, uh, different d designs in terms of how many drivers as well as balance armatures. Uh, it was a Mushra type of test where they're comparing several headphones at a time and ranking them on a 100-point scale according to preference. Everything was level matched. Uh, we eliminated leakage by monitoring the, uh, the uh, pressure inside the ear canal with this little MEMS microphone. And uh, before the listener started the test, we would do a frequency response and make sure it was properly sealed with no leakage. Uh, we had a total of 71 listeners in this test, including an equal number of trained and untrained, and they were all Harman employees from uh, our Michigan and California offices. So just briefly going through the results of these five tests, uh, what we focus here is, is to see how, how well the target did. And in the first test, it, it was rated the highest. The same is true in test two, test three, test four, and in test five, it was about equally preferred with a variation of the target. Uh, so overall, good results as far as acceptance of this uh, new in-ear target. Uh, <clears throat> we found there was an effect related to training, and it's basically something we observe with previous studies where you look at trained and untrained. And generally, the untrained people tend to rate everything higher on the scale, but the overall ranking or the order of the ranking is very similar, and you see that in these, in these four tests. Uh, so whether you're trained or untrained, it seems as though what headphone you like is, is very consistent. Uh, the next thing we did was measure these headphones to see what the correlations are between the subjective and objective measurements. Uh, so here we show headphone 10 uh, in light blue compared to the target in dark blue, and then we calculate the difference between the two, which we call the difference curve. So just looking at the different categories of headphones based on how they were rated, uh, the highest headphones tended to be very close to the target, uh, which is the, the dark black curve. Uh, producing a very low error response curve. And as you go from, from highly rated to lower rated, you see much larger deviations from the har Harman target. So that's kind of a clue that, that, <clears throat> that we might be able to predict preference ratings based on deviations from the target. So we came up with these three metrics, which are essentially different ways of quantifying uh, deviations from the target. We have the absolute slope of the error curve. Uh, so the closer it deviates from zero, uh, the greater the slope will be, uh, the mean error, and then the standard deviation. So <clears throat> using two of these metrics, sorry, three of these metrics, we found that we could predict the measured preference ratings with a correlation of 0.91 with an average root mean square error of five and a half ratings. So pretty good predictions. So the next effort we focused on was doing developing a similar model for around ear, on-ear headphones. So at this point, we had done some farther study and we came up with this green curve, which is the most current uh, target for on-ear, around-ear headphones. Uh, we tested it against 31 different headphones from different manufacturers, ranging in price, uh, transducer type, open back, closed back, and uh, here you can see a list of all the headphones that were involved in this test. Uh, a total of 130 listeners participated, <clears throat> mostly untrained, but also some trained, uh, mostly males, and we looked at different age categories. Of course, these were all Harman employees and uh, were paid for participation. The listening test involved a, a similar design where they're doing a multiple comparison with hidden anchors, hidden references, the Harman target, and a low anchor. So having references and anchors helps uh, stabilize how people use the scale and uh, it's a very effective uh, approach. So here are the results. Again, I'll, I'll just go quickly through these, uh, focusing on how the target did relative to these competitor headphones. So in test one, it was uh, received the highest ratings, same as in test two, test three, test four, it was equally preferred to another headphone. 
And in the final test, it was also equally preferred to two other headphones that were also very close to the Harman target. So just summarizing, highly rated headphones, uh, they tend to follow, closely follow the Harman target. As the scores go down, you see it starts to deviate. Uh, you go down even lower, you see greater deviations. And in the lowest rated headphones, there's large dip, uh, deviations in bass and treble, and uh, they tend to get the lowest scores. So again, uh, it seems as though uh, deviation from the Harman target curve is a good uh, approach to uh, modeling and predicting what sort of rating it will get. And uh, in this case, we were able to predict the ratings with a correlation of 0.86 with a, an error of 6.7 ratings. Uh, we had two headphones that tended to be outliers, and when we remove those from the model, the correlations go up to 0.91, but uh, we decided with only 31 uh, samples, we wanted to keep them in there. So uh, we analyzed this data from this test to uh, using a, a method called cluster analysis to see whether whether people in the test fall into different segments defined by their, their preferred headphones and, and the response of the headphone. So doing that, we found there were basically three classes or segments that people generally fall into based on their headphone tastes or preferences. By far, the largest group of people are 64% of the listeners. Uh, these are people who tend to like the Harman target. And the next largest group was 20%, 21% of the listening listeners we tested. And <clears throat> these are people who like the Harman target with slightly, uh, slightly less base. And then finally, we have a, a, the smallest segment of listeners, 15% of the total group, who tended to like the Harman target with slightly uh, more base. And you can see this in the next graphs. Uh, the red curve are, is the, these are the error response curves of the most five preferred and the least five preferred headphones. And class one and two are people who like the Harman target. Class, sorry, class one and three are people who like it. This dotted blue curve are people who want more bass. And uh, the same kind of bass is, produces the lowest preference ratings in class one and two. So <clears throat> some takeaways is that the Harman target seems to be a good design target since the majority of people prefer it based on our research. And other tastes and sound can be satisfied by slightly adjusting the level of the bass and treble from the Harman target. And these minor adjustments may also be needed to compensate for variations in the program material, so-called circle of confusion uh, issues. So to summarize our headphone research, uh, there's a lot of conclusions, but these are the main ones. Most people we've tested seem to prefer accurate neutral headphones, just like they like accurate neutral loudspeakers. Uh, the Harman target curve seems to be preferred to the current IEC standards that define the diffuse field and to a lesser extent the free field. We did observe some variation in tastes related to demographics, age, gender, listening experience, and hearing loss, but uh, nothing uh, that's too, that can't be uh, mostly satisfied with the Harman target. Uh, we looked at distortion, uh, nonlinear distortion, and in most cases it was not, not a factor. Frequency response is the dominant underlying factor of, what, uh, of the perceived sound quality. And finally, we've shown you two models that reliably uh, predict um, preference ratings based on acoustic measurements and calculating deviations from the Harman target. So the second part of my presentation is uh, some research we've done recently on looking at how headphones deviate or vary as you test them across different test fixtures. And the motivation for this is, is should be obvious. Uh, most of our research up till now has been based on using headphone measurements made on a Grass 45 CA6 <clears throat> that uses a custom pinna that was modified to better simulate leakage effects measured on real humans. Uh, but you know, since we did this research starting in 2012, there's been several new ones introduced, including uh, a, a new uh, grass anthropomorphic pen as well as the B and K hats type 5128. So in order to uh, be able to interpret measurements on these new fixtures, we need to understand how they how they how their measurements vary uh, compared to our previous test fixture. So why did we modify the pennant? Well, this, this hopefully clearly illustrates why. Uh, at that time, the standard KB0070 uh, penna was uh, stood out quite large. It protruded and caused really serious leakage problems. And Todd Welty published a paper that basically uh, captured this quite well. 
So uh, basically Todd measured uh, 10 different headphones on eight subjects using uh, uh, microphones mounted at the blocked ear canal. We did, he did it on plates as well as penna. And here he shows uh, the, the, uh, the measurements of these headphones made on eight humans versus a flat plate and the current penna of that time. And you can see uh, the flat plate uh, is much different than using a penna. So he basically took the existing penna, he, he modified it, <clears throat> he built some 3D molds, printed them, uh, used some silicon, and uh, basically tried to design it so it would replicate the measurements of leakage on human subjects. And here you see two different types of penna that he modified, and uh, when you look at <clears throat> the average error uh, of, the, of the penna versus the uh, human measurements, you can see that the uh, closest to zero is the IEC modification two. Uh, you see that the plate, just using a plate without a penna, will grossly underestimate the leakage. And if you use the current IEC penna of that time, it would grossly overestimate the leakage. So it looks as though with this new modified penna, we could produce headphone measurements that accurately reflect what the response might be on an average human based, based on the small sample we had. So we know our penna has pretty good uh, representation of, of leakage on humans, but how do the other test fixtures do uh, in this regard? So we basically took uh, 20 different headphones, uh, we measured them on each of the different test fixtures we had and did five receipts and compared it to the original grass modified uh, penna that uh, Todd had developed. And uh, we then calculated the, major, the magnitude response uh, of the 20 headphones, calculate the difference curve, and then apply this to the Harman target. So in total, uh, we did 20, 200 measurements. Um, we also did some uh, variations where we had uh, firm and slight pressures applied, and that was, I'm not gonna talk about that because that was mostly to look at how uh, pressures can interact with the mechanical resonances of the cup and the headband and how it affects leakage effects. We also <clears throat> measured these headphones on, uh, uh, with a men's microphone inside the headphone to later compare with the same measurements done on humans. So, uh, so we're just going to look at uh, 200 measurements uh, and average them for each fixture. The test fixtures included these, uh, the hats, the grass Keymar 45BC with the anthropomorphic penna, the Grass 45BB, and I believe this is the older version of the penna. Uh, our original Grass 45CA with the modified penna that's, that's on which the Harman target's based. The current um, Grass 45CA with the anthropomorphic penna, and then finally we also tested the audio precision. A total of 20 headphones were used in these measurements, uh, mostly closed back, but some open back, uh, 17 around ear, and three super oral or on-ear headphones. So here is the average response of the grass 45CA with the modified penna shown in green, and the blue curve is the average response of the B&K type 5128. And the red curve is basically the difference between these two measurements, which uh, I've normalized at uh, three kilohertz. So just as a sanity check here, I looked uh, on the web for a headphone that I'm a bit familiar with. It's the Dan Clark Audio Stealth, $4,000. It just got released and it's highly touted because it's very compliant with the Harman target curve, as you can see in the upper graph, measured on a grass 45CA with the uh, anthropomorphic penna. The same headphone <clears throat> was measured by HeadFi on a 5128 and you can see uh, I've shown the dotted curve as the Harman target. You can see it deviates quite a bit from the Harman target curve compared to the upper measurement. Uh, I've normalized them here at 3K again, and you can see it starts to deviate quite a bit around 1K, and you can see across the, as you go down, uh, there's more and more deviation at lower frequencies. Above 3K, you can see that there's this interesting dip here, which uh, I have not yet explained, and you see some uh, as expected differences in the high frequency response. So just looking at the previous slide, remember, remember that error curve, some of these differences you can, uh, can be explained by the differences in the, in the measurements on the test, test fixtures. Uh, but uh, so you can see that there's this 
declining uh, response at lower frequencies, which explains these differences below 200 hertz. Uh, and you can see these peaks here can be explained as well, but this gap between 1 and 3K, sorry, 3K and 5K is, is, is not explained. I don't know if this <clears throat> could be an interaction uh, which, with this headphone and this fixture that is not typical in the 20 headphones that we tested, or perhaps this sample is not the same between the different reviewers. Anyways, we need to get to the bottom of that. So I plotted the uh, Harman target and this for our original fixture and the B&K 215128. And unfortunately, uh, Harman Legal Department doesn't want me to share this with you, so they've, they've edited the curve. Uh, <clears throat> just looking now at the individual 20 headphone measurements, uh, I've offset these two measurements. The blue ones are uh, the uh, 5128 measurements, and the orange ones are made on the original grass fixture. And the red uh, arrows here are highlighting differences in the bass response. So what you can see is that <clears throat> it depends on which headphone. It tends to be, you see these differences more on closed back headphones than, say, open back headphones, but not always. Uh, the AKG 701 being a good example. And again, you see some differences in bass. Uh, but in some cases, there's very good uh, agreement or at least co consistency between uh, the two fixtures. So uh, if you were to come up with a B&K Harman target using just one or two headphones, uh, you're not going, it's not going to accurately represent a large sample. So this is the advantage uh, because there's this kind of variation uh, interaction with the headphone and the response, you really have to take a statistical approach. So why do you want to have a Harman target customized for the test fixture? Well, for one thing, it uh, allows more meaningful and consistent interpretations of the headphones uh, when you are comparing them across test fixtures. If you want to use these two models I presented to predict preference ratings, then you need to have some kind of correction that accounts for variations across test fixtures. Uh, and I'll give you some examples why you don't want to apply the current target to uh, measurements made on other fixtures. So here's an example of a AKG K701 headphone measured on the left with the grass 45CA mod fixture and the 2158. And I've plotted each graph, each measurement uh, against the Harman target. So you can see right away that uh, the B&K has less base when measured on this fixture compared to the grass. If you calculate the error, error response curve, uh, you can see that it produces a much lower preference rating, a difference of 45 points between the calculated score on one fixture versus the next. And you can see that the slope is much larger, the magnitude of the slope is much larger. And just interpreting these curves, you would look on the grass measurement and say, well, this is a relatively flat error curve. It's a pretty neutral headphone. But when I look at the same graph uh, plotted on the 5128 uh, graph, you can see a very... Uh, positive slope rising upwards, and you might misinterpret this as being a very thin, bright headphone, even though it's the exact same headphone. So when we <clears throat> apply our B and K adjusted target curve, we go uh, of uh, you can see there's there's much more similar when you look at these red curves. They're both the slope is much closer to zero, uh, and the difference between predicted preference uh, is only seven points. So it's easier to interpret, and the scores are much more in agreement. Here's a second example. This is a Sennheiser HD800 measured on uh, these two test fixtures and <clears throat> plotted against the Harman target. And you can see that there's a, almost a 20 point difference in predicted preference rating. And again, looking at these uh, error response curves, uh, the one on the left looks like a relatively neutral headphone, it's very flat error. The one on the right again has this upward slope and it looks very bright and tilted. When you apply the Harman target, customized for the 5128, again, much closer in predicted preference, and the interpretation uh, would produce very similar results. This is a relatively neutral headphone uh, when you apply this modification. Looking at all of these 20 headphones, I, uh, I basically calculated the predicted score based on measurements made on the grass, 45CA modified, and I get this set of results. 
and then I plot <clears throat> the same predicted scores using the B and K measurements measured on the unmodified Harmon target, and you can see quite a large error between the two predicted scores when I adjust the B and K measurements with the adjusted Harmon target curve. Uh, the average error goes from 20, 22 preference ratings down to 5.8. So you can see that we get much better agreement in interpretations and predicted scores using this adjusted Harmon target. So just to conclude, uh, on average, based on the sample of 20 headphones, the, the, the 5128 measurements had less bass and more high frequency above 3K compared to the original fixture. When you apply the existing Harman target to the BNK measurements, uh, you can produce errors of up to 45 ratings on a 100 point preference scale, and the average error is 22 ratings. By applying a modified or customized Harman target, customized to the BNK 5128, the measurements, uh, the average error is reduced to 5.8 ratings, and it allows much more accurate interpretation of the, the balance, the frequency balance of the headphone and the overall sound quality. However, the predicted preference rating uh, and the error in calculating it will, will vary depending on how well the headphone you're testing uh, matches the average sample used to calculate the B and K Harman target curve. So with that, I leave you with this provocative research question, and that is, does the B and K 5128 test fixture overestimate headphone leakage on humans? And you can see, uh, based on this graph, when you compare the original fixture using the modified penna versus the blue curve, there, there is quite a difference in base, which varies from headphone to headphone. So uh, I think we need to do more studies uh, measuring headphones, much, more, much many more headphones on humans and comparing them to these different test fixtures so that we can figure out which one best simulates typical leakage effects. So that's the end of my talk, and I thank you for your attention, and at this point I'll take questions and answers.